wherever uh, this webinar may find you. I am um, very happy to invite you to uh, Richard, Martin, and my um, UKSG panel that unfortunately we were not able to do um, in light of all of the uh, incredible times we're in at the moment. So we thought we would try to do this uh, panel um, via webinar and have been absolutely overwhelmed by the interest. So thank you to everyone who registered um, and who's joining us either um, on Facebook or through Zoom. Um, if you have any questions as the presentations are ongoing, please drop them in the Q&A box, either in Zoom or in the chat um, in Facebook. Um, I'll be monitoring uh, the chat on Zoom. My colleague Susan will be monitoring uh, on Facebook and um, we'll get started uh, by uh, just quick housekeeping and then walking through our slides. Can everyone hear me okay? If folks can just pop into the chat, if they can hear me, if they can see my screen, that would be really helpful. Um, ah, God, everyone is amazing. You guys respond so quickly. Thank you, that's great. Um, and you can raise your hand uh, using the Zoom functionality. You can um, ask questions in the Q&A box. Zoom's added all this new functionality, so feel free to, to play with all of it and we'll see what happens. Um, but when you pose a question, if you don't mind in the chat box, uh, going just putting your name and your organization uh, so, so we all know who we're answering and provide some context. And I might play around with unmuting folks and just letting people um, speak with their cameras on. I know in these times of social distancing, it can be nice to be able to um, see each other's faces. So if you're so inclined, uh, feel free. Um, I'm joined today by my esteemed colleagues, uh, Richard and Martin. Richard is the editor-in-chief at Annual Reviews. Uh, subscribe to Open has been such a buzzword since it launched um, over a year ago, and I'm looking forward to an update from Richard on that. And then Martin, um, co-founder uh, at Open Library of the Humanities, as well as professor at Burbeck College. Really excited to be able to um, learn from them today and share a bit of an update myself uh, what we're doing at uh, PLOS. Again, my name is Sarah and welcome to the webinar. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, turn it over to Martin. And um, Martin, don't forget to unmute yourself. I am unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, can see your screen. Actually can't see your screen yet, hold on. Brilliant, right, there should be a screen. There it is, okay. perfect. All right, thanks so much everyone for coming. So the format for today is that we're gonna each speak for about 10 minutes, I believe, and then we're gonna turn it over to a panel discussion and Q&A and open things up. Um, and I have the uh, unenviable task perhaps of giving just a broader overview of why there's a need for models beyond APCs, um, what these look like and how difficult or otherwise they are to implement, but then also to talk a little bit about what we've done um, in the first five years at the Open Library of Humanities. Uh, so I want to start just with some background contexts for the discussion today. Uh, we exist in um, an increasing world of born digital scholarship. In fact, all scholarship today really is born digital and exists in a digital medium, but we still often focus on a print-centric uh, ecosystem for dissemination of that scholarship. It's as though um, the fact that we have unlimited digital dissemination is seen as an afterthought to producing print uh, correlative artifacts. We also exist in a world of mandates and funder imperatives through open access. Um, now, I don't want to capitalize on the tragedy of the world situation at the moment, but it has thrown in stark relief uh, the need for open scholarship in urgent medical areas. Um, however, the areas that I work in, the humanities disciplines, do themselves a grave disservice if they insist that medical knowledge be shared openly, immediately, and for everyone to access but say it doesn't really matter if our own scholarship is, does not have the same uh, imperative. Now, that's kind of ridiculous because I would far rather there was medical research than another piece of literary criticism. Just don't tell my colleagues I said that. But on the other hand, if we believe in a world in which there is a pl place for humanities research and that we do think it's important that we study cultures, histories, artifacts, archeology, span so on, um, then I do not see why we should not be giving equal parity in the humanities and social scientific disciplines to those at the acute end of the medical spectrum. Why do we need alternative models? Well, apart from the fact that in the disciplines that I'm working with and talking about today, uh, we have the situation where project funding is far harder to come by, so bundling APCs into a grant is often something that is not available. And we're also talking about lower levels of funding for research in these disciplines altogether. 
there's a problem of distribution of article posting charges and book posting charges. And I usually talk about this in a metaphor of uh, imagining that there are 100 people who've come into a room for a talk. If each of the attendees had $10 and the speaker, me, an academic, speaks for free, but the venue needs $50 or so to cover its staff costs and you have 40 talks per year, each of the models we have for scholarly communications at the moment demonstrates a different distribution of those costs. So if you imagine this under a subscription logic, the idea would be that everybody pays, say, 50 cents and can come in and hear the talk. But if you don't pay, you can't come in. So this means that each person could afford to attend half the talks each year, but the broader audience of the general public, uh, scholars without their own allowance uh, to attend these talks and so on, cannot attend and does not get the benefit of that scholarship. Open access with an article processing charge logic looks slightly different. So under that model, the speaker, me, would pay the full fee, uh, which would allow everyone to see the talk and everyone could attend. And if everyone could do this, all the scholarship would be open everywhere. The problem is that the speaker, me, also only has $10 and cannot afford that concentrated cost. This is asking a single point in the system to bear the entire cost of publication. It concentrates costs in ways that in some disciplines are completely untenable. And finally, the types of models we're talking about today, which I call a consortial logic, but goes by other names like subscribe to open, purchasing consortiums, or even knowledge unlatched model. You have a model where five or so people pay to attend the talk and they pay their full amount each say, but they let anyone else attend the talk for free at the same time. Now, an important point about this is that it distributes costs very well in the same way as the subscription ecosystem did, but it gets around the exclusive rivalry of attendance that you had in that upfront pay or you don't come in model. What it doesn't do is miraculously make publishing free, um, let us do infinitely more talks or so on. Uh, it doesn't change the money in the system, it changes the distribution of who is paying. There are some questions though that we can ask. Um, the open access movement has shone a spotlight on publishing costs and where they go and whether or not the venue, for my uh, metaphor of a talk here, is overcharging. Uh, we do have for-profit actors in this system who make 37% profit or so on their scholarly communications activities. We also have some very good not-for-profit actors who are one lawsuit away from bankruptcy. So talking about publishers as though they're a homogenous block who are uh, overcharging by default is perhaps not strictly accurate, but it is a question we can ask. But what I want to point out is that it's not really about uh, the model as such, it's about what the model does to the distribution of the economics within the system and what it allows based on who is paying and what pressure points you're making within any system of payment. And article processing charges as such do not work well in the humanities and elsewhere. And I'll come on to tell you um, what some of our humanists thought of, open, of um, article processing charges when we suggested that as a model at the start of our project. I want to point out also that we have different artifact types and that these come with different costs. And if we simply apply an article processing charge model that has worked well in project funded scientific disciplines to humanistic artifacts such as books, we have an enormous problem with this concentration of costs. So a recent Mellon Ithaca study put the cost of producing a single book at between $15,000 and $130,000 uh, for a single book. Now, I don't recommend you go and tell your deans that it costs $130,000 to produce a book because they'll shut down the university press tomorrow. Um, what's clearly happened in that case is that they have uh, hired a, um, some kind of editor to work on a book with an academic. It might be a critical edition or so on. So there are clearly staff costs bundled there. But what you can see if you think about this is that the article processing charges or book processing charges in this case they're being charged are roughly equivalent to the aggregated sales figures. So a $17,000 um, book processing charge at Palgrave Macmillan is the equivalent of them selling 200 copies of the book at $95 each. Now again the $95 distributed among 200 copies is a much more palatable payment for many institutions to make than a single payment of $17,000. Uh, as a, just so people have an idea of kind of budgetary scales, uh, my university, part of the University of London, 
our department's entire budget for the year for book purchasing is £7,000. So we could not afford a single book processing charge. Our faculty publish multiple books per year. The concentration of costs, again, just does not work. Um, if you're interested more in the book side of things, I also wanted to put out a plug for our COPIM project at the moment, uh, which is a community owned project around open access monographs. It's funded by Research England and the Arcadia Trust. And essentially we're looking at building shared infrastructures for open access books. And we're looking at ways in which we can convert some existing university presses lists to an open access model that is sustainable uh, using multiple models at the same time. So never getting rid of prints because people still seem to want it while recognizing that could be a revenue source for these entities. But last and not least, I want to talk today about what we've done over the last half decade, implementing a non-APC model for journal publishing in the humanities disciplines. So I founded a project, uh, initially seeded it as an idea in 2013 called the Open Library of Humanities. Uh, we run a mega journal, by which I mean a transdisciplinary journal, um, which uh, is not mega in the sense of plus one by that kind of scale, but it's pretty big for the humanities. Um, we have 27 other journals on the platform and we're a not-for-profit entity who are collectively funded. So I'm just gonna go through that a little bit. So we started with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And without these upfront grants, I'd like to point out the work that we did in getting libraries to contribute to an open access solution uh, where there was not exclusivity for payment would have been absolutely impossible. Implementing new business models that people haven't heard of before is a huge amount of work. It's not trivial and it has overheads and costs. It took three plus years for full time of my works going around the world, speaking to libraries, explaining to them, we want a different, different economic model. It's not an article processing charge. It's not a subscription, but it looks like a kind of combination of the two. Once people got it, great. But actually we had to have face-to-face -face conversations with well over 150 libraries in that time. And people hadn't really heard of this for journal publishing before. So it took a huge amount of labor on the ground. And what does our model look like? So the current system, by the way, these are not restrooms or anything like that. They're just um, a sign for people. That was the only uh, one I had, but, or libraries in this case, the current system looks a bit like this. We have lots of libraries paying relatively large sums into a rivalrous system that keeps people out. Um, ironically, much of that library funding is going to erecting the technological structures um, that uh, enact exclusion, which is not what libraries really purport their mission to be, but it's how the system is working. We propose just to flip this round. So what if we got lots of libraries to pay relatively small sums into a small not-for-profit publisher uh, and we just made everything openly accessible. So there wasn't the system where we keep people out. Everyone said that won't work because why will libraries pay for something they will get for free? They won't really get it for free because we cannot exist if libraries do not support us. We are just about sustainable at the moment, but it is close with 300 libraries that we have at the moment, and we can always do with more joining. But nonetheless, we've demonstrated that at at least a moderate scale, you can start a new enterprise with a new model that is non-classical in the economic sense to which people will sign up. There are some small benefits for libraries. They have a governance stake in new titles joining the platform, so we don't just expand and eat into their resources um, astronomically. Um, and this gives some sense of control over the expansion of our growth, which I think is helpful in an era where libraries have often just been forced to take on big deals. As I said, we have over 300 libraries coming from zero financially supporting us in the first five years. And I'd be really interested when Richard speaks to hear his perspective on working with an exi existing subscription base and switching that over. Because the challenge for us was that we didn't exist before we started. So we had no real track record to show what we could do. And we relied on the model being the selling point. Whereas I suspect that Richard's experience might be slightly different there, but I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing that. Um, so as I said, 27 journals now, and that's very outdated statistic, but essentially there's some numbers here that show you how it breaks down when you distribute it. And our cost per institution per article is around $1.10 which looks much more palatable in the way things are distributed 
than it does when you have an article processing charge model. And we've almost met that target of 300 plus libraries. It hovers around that mark at the moment. I'll just talk for the last minute. I'm sorry, I'm over time, Sarah. I know I've done my typical academic thing and just spoken and spoken. Um, we have an ongoing project to flip subscription journals to an open access basis. Um, I'll let Richard say more about this, but perhaps the most uh, celebrated instance of that in our case was the migration of Elsevier's editorial board at Lingua to a new title, Glossa, that we fund um, and the success that that has had in attracting previous submission rates and high quality publication uh, as when it was at a major international for-profit publisher. We're also spreading this model to others where we can. So ERID have been in conversation about whether their model in Canada might take on this uh, non-classical non economic model for funding scholarly communications in an open access basis without article processing charges. And that's where I'll stop. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that was of interest and I'm looking forward to hearing my co-panelists speak. Thank you. That's great, Martin. Thank you. I, I have a ton of questions now, so I'll have to save them till the end there. But I will hand it over to our colleague Richard, um, a very different model in a very different context, but I think uh, really complementary to what Martin's about to share. Uh, Richard, can you share your screen? Yes, I can. Thanks very much, Sarah. And thanks very much, Martin. That was uh, most interesting. I hope that my screen is now shared. Can you confirm, Sarah? Not yet, not yet. I might be thinking. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because I haven't pressed share yet. <laughs> How's that? How's that? Now I can see it. Uh, so I want to start, um, and I hope everyone's doing very well and not getting too stir crazy if you're uh, in isolation. I want to start with a little bit of an update on our response to the um, COVID-19 pandemic. On March the 13th, we made the decision to uh, remove all the access controls uh, on annual reviews content and make it um, accessible to anyone anywhere in the world. And I just want to share with you the results that we've got uh, so far. This slide shows the usage of <clears throat> all annual reviews content over the past five and a little bit years, um, along the, the um, x-axis, the one to 12 are the months of the year, and the combined usage um, of HTML and PDF downloads is shown on the y-axis. You, you'll see that um, we've increased year on year from somewhere around half a million downloads a month in 2015, which is the yellow line, uh, gradually increasing each year to uh, an average of somewhere around a million uses a month in 2019. 2020 was tracking um, very close to 2019 until the middle of March when we opened the content up and you can see that there's a well overall a 70 percent increase in the number of article accesses um, in March of this year as compared to last year. As a, as a direct result of, of us removing the, uh, the um, access control. We've seen, I, I won't go into any more, more at the moment, I will if anybody wants to ask me, um, because it's eating into my 10 minutes. So to get to my first slide, um, I want to talk about our um, approach to opening up the content, which we call subscribe to open. In four parts, I'll describe the rationale, even though I've just shown uh, the uh, evidence that, that, that we should be doing this. I'll describe where we, how we got to where we are just now. I'll um, talk about what the subscribe to open strategy is, um, where we are with our pilot program, and what I think that the next steps might be. The, the rationale comes from the mission of the organization. Um, Annual Reviews is a nonprofit publisher. We are dedicated to synthesizing and integrating knowledge for the progress of science and the benefit of society. And we publish review articles, we're, uh, we're a one-trick pony, uh, and these are contributed by recognized experts across the 51 fields that we publish in. And a, a good review article captures the current understanding of a topic, both what is well supported and what's controversial, and it highlights major questions that remain to be addressed. 
we consider our core audience to be researchers, um, students and faculty, but um, there are many other audiences for this type of information. It's our view, certainly my view, that a functional democracy requires that policymakers, practitioners and citizens have access to the knowledge and wisdom of the world's leading researchers. Unfortunately, we're seeing a very um, vivid demonstration of that need at the moment, but I think it was already there and it will continue in so many different ways beyond the current situation. So we felt that we uh, had an imperative to open up our content and we looked at the options. Uh, and I'm very grateful to Martin for covering this in, in, in nice detail and uh, uh, very eloquently. We couldn't go for article processing charges. Our view was that since we were inviting authors, we couldn't very well present them with a bill after they'd agreed to write or after they'd submitted an article. And the high cost of um, publishing review articles really was a, an enormous barrier to um, inviting anyone, let alone people from uh, less uh, uh, well-off um, institutions to write for us. We didn't publish. Uh, which was becoming popular around that time, didn't really work for us either. Um, most of our authors are from uh, a small number of leading research institutions, not all of them, but most of them. And that would mean that the burden would fall on very few subscribers to pay for all of what we published. And my first um, thought was to talk to philanthropists and funders to see if we could get support there. Luckily, um, uh, Two colleagues, um, uh, Cameron Name from Annual Reviews and uh, Rain Crow from Chain Bridge, came up with a better system, which was to leverage existing relationships that we had and existing systems that we had um, to pursue what came to be called uh, Subscribe to Open, or as we call it in-house S2O. The basics of the strategy are this. We ask our existing customers to continue to subscribe to the titles and we give them a 5% discount as an incentive to do that. When all the subscribers commit um, to, to the journal, we publish that journal under a Creative Commons license and we remove the paywall to all previous volumes as well. We are not committing to going back and changing those licenses to Creative Commons licenses just because it would be so much work to track down authors and so forth. Um, so if the support from the, the library community is insufficient, we'll continue to publish the journals um, with a paywall. It's very important, we feel, um, that it's more important for us to publish the journal um, uh, under paywall circumstances than not to publish it at all. But our strong preference is to publish these journals open access. But there's a guarantee that we will publish either way. Um, each year the open access or the subscribe to open offer is repeated uh, with each subsequent volume. And through the course of the year, we'll monitor usage to try and attract new subscribers uh, to the program. So uh, reducing the uh, cost to each individual um, subscriber. So the features of subscribe to open are that it uses the conventional subscription process, it utilizes existing library budgets, it retains that curation function of librarians, which uh, we believe is very important. It provides an incentive by lowering the subscription cost. And importantly, it's a donation, it's not a subscription. Um, the Subscribe to Open program satisfies procurement policies of, um, of universities and participation is really a requirement to guarantee success. So you are actually subscribing here, you're not making a, a, an in-kind a, a financial donation. Richard, just to clarify, you meant that it's not a donation, right? Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it, was, it was reversed. It's not a Thank donation. You. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so the pilot program, which is running at the moment, uh, comprises five journals that are listed there. Um, as of today, about 90% of our 2020 customer invoices have been paid. Um, some journals don't collect invoices because they publish later in the year. 
Um, and for all those five journals that are in this program, uh, the numbers of subscribers are ahead of the subscribers that we had um, at this time in 2019. We've already um, published two uh, of, the, of the journals subscribe to open. The annual review of cancer biology was published on March the 9th and public health on April the 2nd. And the others will be um, announced uh, at the time of publication. Uh, that's really because we're still collecting subscription revenues on those titles. And we feel that if we announced that they were going to be open access and that we'd achieved our goals, then subscribers wouldn't necessarily feel obliged to uh, contribute in the way that we hope that they will. So the, the jury is still out on three of the titles, but I would say that the situation is promising. Um, this is uh, similar data to the data that I showed at the beginning. This is for cancer biology. The line in teal is the usage per, uh, per month um, for 2019. I haven't given the actual numbers here, um, but uh, this shows the, the rise in usage in March. There always is a, a slight rise or, or, or a rise anyway when you, when you publish a new volume of, of the journal even though the articles come out gradually through the year, we do get a boost then, but nothing like the boost that we've seen uh, as a result of the article going open access. Answer, annual Review of Cancer Biology has no papers on, on um, coronaviruses. So this is all people that are interested in finding out about cancer biology. So open questions, I have three and next steps. Um, the first open question is if this pilot is successful, Will we add more titles in 2021? The answer is uh, that we'll be discussing that at our board meeting next month, and I'm hopeful that we will. Uh, an unknown and, and, and an additional um, uh, issue is, will the economic fallout, the inevitable economic fallout, which will hit libraries um, as much as any other part of society, will there be fallout from the epidemic that impacts the interest of librarians in supporting Subscribe to Open, we're going to have to start talking to our customers about that. I'm hoping again that the answer is no. And in fact, the, um, the epidemic shows the, the real um, imperative to move to Subscribe to Open for our titles. And the third thing, that, the third open question is, can we develop a safety net so that we wouldn't have to revert to gated access in cases if there was a year where we didn't uh, reach the target um, participation level and subscribe to open. And uh, that's something that we are pursuing at the moment. Next steps, uh, we want to learn and evolve this approach by sharing information. Um, so here today and um, hopefully with um, many of the people on this, uh, on this call, uh, over the next few months. We're working with Rame Crow to develop a community of practice for Subscribe to Open so that we can have some uh, community um, best practice and sharing of information. Uh, Annual Reviews is interested in participating in the wider um, goals of open access and open science and generally continuing to pursue the mission of um, supporting the progress of science and the ben benefiting society at large. And that's it from me. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks for that update, uh, Richard. It's always really interesting to hear what's happening um, with that model. And uh, given that Rame is working with us on our model, um, it's a nice transition into um, my slide. So let me see if I can share my screen. Let me know if you can see uh, my slides, all right? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so again, if you have questions, please do drop them in the Q&A box. And if you can put your name and org, that would be really helpful. I will dive into uh, my overview and, and try to stay on time here. I'll, I'll take a look. Um, so th there is the question uh, we've received of, you know, why is PLOS playing in the new business model space? And the answer is really, um, we can't afford not to. Uh, the market is evolving so quickly with transformative deals, um, with really innovative models like the ones you've heard today, that um, if we want to maintain um, our position 
as kind of a leading innovator in open access publishing, uh, we need to be working in this space, particularly because we run the risk of um, some of these larger commercial agreements locking in library funds for a long time over the, um, the course of the next couple of years. This, these models, um, as they're evolving, if they continue to focus largely on APCs, um, which we have real concerns about for the same reasons Martin raised, um, really run the risk of a less diverse publishing ecosystem when we come out of the other side of this transition uh, into fully open access that's really been hypercharged by Plan S. So we really want to explore new business models that include APCs, but are also um, built on other, on other um, systems. And we've been overwhelmed by the support of the library and consortia community in helping us achieve this. So again, while APCs, we were amongst the first to start using them, we've seen a lot of success in the last 20 years uh, with debuting them as a business model. We are really concerned about the unintended consequences um, of APCs as a long-term solution to open access. And it's something our CEO, Allison Muddit, has spoken quite a bit about. I think Martin provided a really nice overview of what the concerns are here. Um, put simply, if we're shifting the barriers from paying to read to paying to publish, we still have a barrier. And if the goal is a truly free to publish, free to read paradigm, APCs are getting in the way from that. Um, of course, there are researchers in certain geographies, disciplines, and stages of their careers who simply cannot participate in this kind of model. Penalizing them for that is problematic. And we always have to sort of remember the, the power structures that underpin all of this, which is these models are developed by um, a certain ge geography that dominates scholarly publishing. They work well for those, um, those organizations and institutions, but they don't work for everyone. And um, if COVID-19 tells us anything, we need everyone uh, working together to answer uh, these kinds of big questions. So those kinds of barriers aren't appropriate. So we're working on a lot of different deal types with um, uh, consortia and individual libraries. And I have to say thank you again to, to many of you who are on the call who've been part of those conversations. Um, we're trying to be very transparent about the work that we're doing, uh, the costs involved around it. I really appreciated Martin raising the um, tremendous lift it takes to launch a new model. Um, I had no idea it was three years for you, Martin. That's that's consoling to me that I've that I'm not the ballpark time period I have in my head is, is not too far from that. Um, so there's a number of models here and I can happy to talk about uh, the first four in the Q&A, but I wanna focus on the collective action model because it's in a way a nice evolution from the work um, Rame Crow at Chambridge has done with annual reviews. So we um, moved into looking at collective action because we sort of faced similar challenges um, to thinking about how to do a model in a world where the content is already open. And there is no possibility that PLOS would ever consider closing its content. So the kind of leverage mechanism of subscribe to open doesn't work for a native open access publisher. So the thinking you're gonna see on the next couple slides is very much a work in progress. So you will see pricing, you will see um, tiering and costs. And I'm gonna caveat on every slide that none of this is final. All of this is being market tested now with consortia and libraries. If you are an organization that wants to be involved with that and we haven't reached out to you yet, largely as a function of me just being one person doing this, um, please reach out to me. But uh, please, please, please take to heart that none of this is final and we're still soliciting a lot of feedback on how to do this right and hope that you all will be part of that. So why collective action? Why did we explore this? The reality is the problem of paying for selectivity and, and Richard alluded to this in his comments. Reviews are very expensive to publish. Highly selective journals are very expensive to publish. So PLOS Medicine and PLOS Biology are the first two journals um, PLOS launched way back in 2001. Um, and they're highly selective. They only accept about 10% of the articles that they publish. They don't publish that many articles. Um, and they are you know, high impact factor, high prestige uh, journals. The actual costs for them to break even are extremely high, $5,500 to $6,500 US um, to cover the cost of publishing in those journals. 
the, the ongoing APC that we pay, we charge right now is $3,000. So you can imagine over time, the losses on those journals are significant. And while we had a cross subsidy model that really worked for a long time with plus one sort of covering those costs, the, the universe has changed, the world has changed. There's a lot more mega journals now. There's a lot more um, that we want to do with these journals um, to evolve them as aligned with the PLOS mission. And um, they need to carry their weight in terms of uh, the costs that they're bringing to the organization. But we don't think carrying that weight can, can work in the uh, sense of raising the APC to these levels. We're not comfortable doing with that. It, it's contrary to our model, our mission. Uh, so how do we think about highly selective journals and move away from expensive APCs? This is the problem we're trying to solve. And so POS medicine and biology are the, really the focus of this. So when you think of collective action, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of nuance to this, and I'm not sure if Raim is on the, on the webinar, but he, he hopefully he won't take too much issue with my characterization of this. The question we're trying to figure out is, can we pool the resources of the organizations that have the most um, investment in these journals to uh, allocate the fees in a way that's equitable based on the benefit to participants? So like what Richard was saying, this is not a donation. You are not paying to access content. The content is already open. You're paying for the ability to publish in POS medicine and POS biology. Uh, and that is sort of the, so if you take kind of the author pays, we're switching now to the institution pays for you to publish as opposed to the institution pays for you to read. Now, it's not a subscription though, because it requires a certain amount of, um, it requires collective to work. So I will get into that, but let me just quickly review the goals of the model. So separately, we want the journals to break even. They, they At least they need to break even to contribute um, to kind of carry their weight within our journals portfolio. Ideally, we'd like to add a 10% surplus to that break even number for reinvestment back in the journals. Once we reach that, there is no um, growth beyond that. We tend, tend to cap the number of articles that are published in each of those journals. Um, we need to equitably distribute the cost and we want to get rid of APCs entirely. So our goal is at the end of this pilot period, however long that's going to be, and we haven't figured that out yet, uh, the APCs to publish in this journal completely go away and it is truly a free to read, free to publish journal, set of journals, sorry, two journals. So how the collective should work. For the collective to work, much like with annual reviews, a certain number of institutions have to commit to participate for the collective to succeed. If they don't, the collective fails and we have to find another way to make these journals break even. Um, so success means moving forward and it can happen in a number of ways that we're still frankly trying to figure out what makes the most sense. Um, in a perfect world, we'd secure the amount of commitment that we need from the number of institutions we need. Uh, and then overnight flip the model from APCs to, uh, to this collective model. Um, there is a world in which you may have authors paying APCs alongside this model working, but the sort of a true collective would, would all happen at once. Everyone jumps at once because everyone's committed together. And if we don't get enough commitment, the collective doesn't move forward. An important piece to this is that the margin is capped. We are not trying to bring in more and more and more institutions to grow that margin. 10% is about what we need. When the pilot period is over, if more institutions have joined over the course of the pilot, ideally when the next round um, of solicitation to be part of the collective happens, because we have more organizations participating, ideally your, your, your participation um, fee by tier would go down if we're able to grow the collective. Um, the price increases are transparently tied to cost. I mean, our goal with this model, if we if we succeed with it, is to have an entire page on our site that breaks out, you know, here are the tiers, here are the prices, here's the cost we're trying to cover. Um, we, we feel that that is critical to making um, a collective work. And there's got to be penalties or some kind of downside for failure to participate. Just like Richard was saying with subscribe to open, if you announce with a new journal that we're definitely gonna do subscribe to open and everyone knows it's already gonna be open, you're creating a disincentive for folks to join um, the group. Here, the disincentive um, hopefully is going to be that folks, well, we're, I shouldn't say hopefully, because we're not sure yet, but one of them is going to be potentially, you'd have to pay the true APC if you don't participate. 
um, as a function of, of the way selectivity works. But we're, we're working that out and we need feedback from the community um, on the best ways to not only implement this, but, but incentivize participation. Because like Martin said, it is not an insignificant number of institutions that we need to participate to make this work. And as a business development team of one here, um, using consortia uh, to help us get that volume is gonna be critical. Um, and then of course, we try to avoid free riding by really tightly aligning the benefits with the people who publish the most in these journals. And I'll get into the details around that momentarily. So just to give you a sense of the numbers we're looking at, um, PLOS Biology, uh, their current revenue is that top line, same with PLOS Medicine. The direct and indirect cost on both of those uh, titles is the second line. And um, we, we came, to, a lot of the numbers used for that are actually the same numbers that we're using in the price transparency pilot that we're participating in through Plan S. So um, we have kind of a nice consistent model for how we're, we're looking at cost in that way. And so the direct plus indirect plus 10% targets are right there. And the goal is if we can hit those numbers, um, we jump together. And if we can't, then we have to go back to the drawing board. So just to give you a sense of what we're trying to keep, um, keep in mind and caveat again, this is still all very much in development. So um, keep that in mind. The way that we looked, um, at aligning benefit with participation was really who publishes. And as many of you can be aware, there is a huge issue with institutional disambiguation and attribution that's related to this question. But we, we did a lot of work to, to figure out who are the institutions that are most often corresponding authors on an article and what are the institutions that are most often contributing authors on an article. There's overlap, of course, but could we group them? We've temporarily for now labeled those who are most often corresponding primary published institutions and we'll need your feedback if that's a good label or not. Um, those who are most often corresponding authors, or excuse me, contributing authors, we're calling secondary published institutions. So within those two big tiers, we have four smaller tiers that again break out cost based on your historical publishing with PLOS in these journals in the last five years. So as you can imagine, in primary publish, the biggest institutions, tier one, tier two, um, they'll pay a little bit more, but they uh, publish much more often. And as you go down the tiers and get into secondary publish, of course, the incentive to participate goes down because you don't publish as much, but the cost to participate and hedge yourself against the possibility that you may want to be a contributing author in future uh, is very reasonable. And, and that's important because the, the way this model will work is if the contributing author institutions and the corresponding author institutions are both members. Um, there are not enough corresponding author institutions to make the cost compelling for the institutions uh, that, that we would need. And um, on a sort of more philosophical level, we really think we need to start getting away from this distinction between corresponding as being the most important author and contributing authors just you know being the long tail they, they, they contribute in different ways and they should be contributing uh, similarly to to the model read institutions are a really important um, uh, group here um, they are depending on the region and the consortium and the organization either very keen to participate in this and to support it or to have nothing to do with it because they don't publish. And this is getting to the question that Martin spoke to of, you know, if we shift to a fully pay to publish universe, a lot of uh, published institutions are gonna bring on a lot of cost while read institutions money exits the system. So there is a world in which read institutions could participate in this. We hope they will. And we're, we're working on that with organizations like Scalp and Lyricist and others. Um, but for the, the modeling, just the numbers, we did not want to depend on any read institutions to make this work. And so we only focused on the um, institutions that you'll see in the primary publish and secondary publish uh, tiers. So just understand that for the numbers, we, we didn't assume any read participation. And again, notice that these are very subject to change. Um, we're still working out the modeling, um, the final kinks, but a, a quite a few consortia and libraries are waiting for us to send them the tiering uh, for their, their participation. Um, for PLOS Medicine, um, a journal whose APC would be about $6,200 to, to break even, 
this is the range. So a tier one institution, primary publish, your University College London, your Monash in Australia, your, you know, Max Planck, your, your Harvard's, your University of California, San Francisco, their fee would be about 15 grand um, in tier one, roughly based on our modeling so far. As you can see, if you compare that to what the true APC is, that's about three papers. If you compare it to the APC they pay now of $3,000, that's five papers. That's nothing compared to um, what you would, you would spend if you continue to pay APCs. So we're hoping that because we've distributed across a lot of institutions and we're not requiring 100% participation in every tier, that we'll be able to um, have a meaningful number to, to hit our goal without um, undue charges to different um, organizations. The bio fees are a little bit higher, you'll see them here, but again, compared to an APC of about $5,500, they're, they're pretty compelling. Um, and so I'm, I need to wrap up because I've, I've been talking too long. So the next steps for us in this model are um, getting uh, feedback from institutions around how they would participate, if they would participate, what what the policies around this would look like, how to implement it. Uh, for any folks participating in consortia, please reach out because your consortia are going to be very critical to um, helping us get this off the ground. We need to come up with a name. Subscribe to Open is not appropriate because this is not a subscription, so we've got to think of something else. Um, and hopefully, uh, if your organization wants to participate, you'll reach out to me um, for more information. So with that, let me stop talking at you. I think we have a lot of questions here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, I've chosen to put my screen into grid view. So hopefully, um, you can see all of our faces. And um, why don't we start with the questions that came from Martin from the beginning. Um, so let me jump in here. So Martin, do you have the capacity to approach journals that might flip or do you have to be completely reactive? Also, are there some common questions or concerns from subscription journals you have spoken to uh, around your model? And that's from Bernie. So we do outreach where people have expressed an interest, but fundamentally there are lots of external drivers that bring people to us. Uh, the current economics of what we're doing are such that we turn down about three fifths of journals that have approached us simply because the economic scaling doesn't work at the same pace as scaling in parallel with uh, taking on new titles. And what I mean by that is that library budget increases are measured in percentage terms rather than absolute terms. So the ridiculous thing is that if you want to join OLH and support what we're doing, it costs you less than a single APC at a commercial publisher. But if we increase our price by $100, it then looks like we've done a 10% increase on the price, but it's $100 at the end of the day. For most libraries, that is not a huge increase, but they still query, well, it's 10%. So there are actually structural things in the library purchasing system that prohibit rapid growth of small new publishers when we could be doing much better work. I mean, likewise, um, the other thing that people often ask me, because you know, when you when you approach a learned society or an existing title, one of their concerns is you're a young new publisher. What's the bit, what's the likelihood you'll still be going in another five years? What's your sustainability and longevity? And the simple answer is that we've had great library support, and please do come support us if you don't already. But external factors, as Richard mentioned, like COVID nineteen and long term instability, long term fluctuations in library budgets can make these types of model less appealing in economically strict times. And what we really need to do, in my view, we don't have the disincentive of going back to a subscription model either, but what we do have is the threat that we will not exist. And in absolute terms, we cost so little to support. And if you really want to just keep giving all your money to Elsevier in when your austerity budget hits, then that is by all means your uh, imperative to so do. But we managed to make it go a lot further for a lot better cause with a, a model that clearly, as this pandemic shows, is much better for knowledge dissemination. So that's why I think people come to us is that we've stuck resolutely to that mission. We've got good answers to the economic questions and we are sustainable, but we could be so much bigger and have done so much more were it not for external constraints on us that are totally beyond our control. That's great, Martin. Thank you. Um, for... I have so many thoughts about that, Martin, but we don't have enough time, so I'll 
I'll come back to it. Uh, Richard, um, you touched on how COVID-19 has mobilized the Stalcom community to enable free access. This is an acknowledgement of how suboptimal the paywall system is, which I think is something we can all agree with. What can we do to accelerate the more global transition to open through a subscribed open model? What will it take in terms of commitment um, now that the content has been made open? Can we keep it that way? So I think that speaks to your kind of next steps uh, with subscribe to open that you were outlining, uh, Richard? Um, well, you know, in an ideal world, you could say, at least in our case, we've demonstrated the value of the content being available. Why does everyone not just continue? Why do we not f flip all of our journals to subscribe to open um, now? Um, and while I believe that librarians as a as as a group have the very best interests of society at heart and would probably not take much convincing to do that there are all kinds of um, economic barriers institutional um, budgets um, people that are economists people at the state level that might not see the value of making this content available to blah 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 people in China and so on and so forth. Um, we we we've got something that is very important that we protect. I mean, annual reviews has served uh, a, a, an important function to the research community for um, nearly ninety years. And uh, you know, my first job is to is to not screw that up. Uh, while at the same time trying to improve things to the extent that we can. So um, I would love to see a discussion about it being accelerated. We would certainly be happy to participate in that, but we have to keep one eye on our, our long-term sustainability. That's exactly the challenge I think all three of us are facing. Um, from Annalise. Oh, good to see you, Annalise. Thanks for joining. Uh, you raised a huge point that I didn't speak clearly about uh, when I was showing the pricing tiers. Those primary publish and secondary publishing pricing tiers that you saw around 15,000 US dollars at the highest point for, for example, PLOS Medicine, those are annual um, collective fees that the institution would pay um, over the course of a pilot. So let's say the pilot is three years, Harvard University Medical School would pay $15,000 each year, and none of their authors would pay an APC as a result. So that flat fee annually means that when your authors go to publish, the system recognizes that that corresponding author is a member, the contributing authors are also participating in the collective, and therefore there's no APC uh, for them to participate. So an essential uh, point that I perhaps wasn't super clear on. Um, Richard, do you have anything you can share on the demographic of users in 2020 compared to 2019 um, when you made the journal open this year versus? Yeah, uh, a, a little bit. You know, we have the uh, data with um, PSI to do IP um, analysis, and then we'll, we'll have a lot more information at that point. But I have some interested numbers. Um, the sort of heartwarming thing for us was the usage in uh, poor countries where, frankly, we don't have huge reach with our subscriptions. So I compared the um, downloads by country um, between January of um, this year and March of this year. South Africa, we had 3,000 downloads in January, 14,000 in March. Um, Ethiopia, um, not quite as big uh, a jump. Um, actually, I think it may be because there's not good uh, access for academics and so on uh, in Ethiopia, not good internet access, uh, and it was roughly the same. Kenya went from 1,700 to 2,400, Pakistan from 3,000 to 12,000, India from 26 to 77,000, I mean the, the, the Philippines 6,500 to 14,000, we really saw broad usage um, all over the world. Uh, at the same time, we saw 200,000 more um, accesses in the United States. So this is a very broad um, increase in usage. What I'm very interested to see is whether it comes from um, academic institutions or whether we're seeing the wider general public and policymakers and public health institutions and so on 
um, increasing their usage as well. Who's next? Sorry, I lost track of the questions. Martin. Um, so the libraries are supporting OLH. Are they using their serials collection budget? Are they using their OA budgets? Um, are they using the petty cash? How are they, uh, what, what buckets are they going to to participate? It varies hugely by institution. And I, I just wanted to follow up from Richard in that we have um, very different questions asked of us by different libraries as to what usage means. So actually some, in, some institutions at small theological colleges who support us, for example, want to know, are our, are our students and our faculty reading this material? Um, often those at big research intensive universities who are, are subscribing to us want to know, are our authors publishing with us? Um, both of those metrics actually turn out to be harder to collect than you'd like due to dodgy metadata uh, or um, the problem of geolocating openly accessible resources to IP addresses and our reluctance to actually do that. But I just wanted to point out that how people make that spending decision is really conflicted in this environment. But our rates of ask are such that essentially um, a head of library can make the call out of, out of the petty cash. So again, yes. keeping in absolute terms below a level that can just be signed off has been hugely beneficial to us in getting enough uh, institutions on board. That said, lots of the time it comes out of the subscription budget. Um, we do have a rivalrous benefit, as I said, in the governance stake. So this can be billed as subscription and does get around the, it's not just a donation. Um, right. On the other hand, the tax authorities in our country ruled that that was not sufficient to trigger a VAT um, uh, charge. So that tax does not apply to, to what we charge. Um, others have been using funding from uh, block grants from Research Councils UK and in the UK, for example, now UKRI. Uh, we've seen direct funder payments as well. So the FWF in particular in Austria has been an incredible supporter of us over the last five years. Um, the Wellcome Trust has uh, supported us year on year um, as an institution from outside. And although we don't charge APCs to anyone because we don't want that barrier, so it's not limited to whether you're subscribing or not, a really effective um, strategy we have is when an author publishes with us and once the work is out that's when we write to a library and say look this is cheaper than it would have been anywhere else would you consider subscribing and this conversion rate on that is astronomical because the fees are low there's a clear rationale as the author just published etc so it cut the answer is we have a completely diverse range of sources there are good ways we can uh, situate what we offer within any of those budgets and explain that to a library if they need to justify it. But essentially the ask is not high in the first place, so it rarely attracts the kind of scrutiny that you'd see if you were asking for you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And I want to just jump in with the last question here because I, I think we're going to run out of time. There's many more questions from folks. We will pull them together, answer them, and send them around to everyone who registered and attended. So fear not, we will get to your question. Um, the last thing came from Gaynor, and I think it's a really it's relevant to all of us, all three of us. So I wanted to raise it: is how have the library consortia been supporting? Um, your models. From the POS perspective, I've been leaning on all of our consortia partners to help out because like you said, Martin, um, three years of face-to-face -face conversations, visiting libraries, A, not possible right now given their current conditions, B, um, a real uh, resource uh, constraint in terms of getting in front of everyone, especially if conferences and things aren't happening. What have been, how, how have you both, uh, with rolling this out with your organizations, used consortia? And if not, are, are you using other kinds of mechanisms to, to get to the subscribers you need? Richard, do you want to take that first? Sure. Um... Hugely helpful, I would say, um, both in giving us feedback as we develop the program and in understanding it and helping their members to understand it in coming out publicly in, in favor of it. Um, it's been, I think we're, we're seeing sort of the emergence of a, of a partnership, which was sadly lacking, I think, between publishers and and the librarian community through these sorts of interactions. And I think it's uh, hats off to them. They've been, they've been terrific. Yeah, so- a football manager there, didn't 
I think one of the huge problems of APCs for libraries that's often unremarked upon is that it makes a series of micro transactions that are hugely bureaucratic, difficult to implement, track and monitor at the article level. Um, working at the consortial level with libraries is really just a way of scaling up the benefits of getting billing down to as small as um, an attack surface as you can and making it easier for all involved. We, you know, we, we really value the way in which those networks can disseminate the message of what we're trying to do and get people on board. So we actually have a consortial discount system where if you can get a group of 10 libraries together, it doesn't even have to be formalized as an independent consortial organization then we will give you a discount or as a group that you can share out as you see fit between your members. And it, it just saves us that uh, in-person labor, which is massive. There is one challenge with that that I'll mention, which is that what do you do when a library is a member of multiple consortial groups? Um, we, don't really, we don't really want to discount you down to zero. Um, no. because <laughs> we're, we're, that's a whole nother webinar, I think, Martin. So we'll have to come back to that. But we are at time. Um, we really appreciate there's a very robust discussion actually happening in the chat um, that I'm trying to uh, save so we can revisit it. Um, I would very much like to uh, do this conversation again, hopefully um, with maybe some different different perspectives. Um, really appreciate the time, Richard, Martin. Um, so sorry we couldn't be at UKSG to do this. We will be sending around the recording, um, the slides, and uh, we'll pull the questions and get those answered to all of you. Wherever you are, be safe, be healthy, have a great rest of your day. If you're in the UK, have a lovely long weekend, and uh, everyone will speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.